The Pope and Young Club wants to welcome you as we rally together to ensure our bow hunting opportunities for today and tomorrow. You've come to the podcast that believes in preserving, protecting, and promoting the passion for bow hunting. Join us as we strive to be the voice of today's bow hunter. This is the Pope and Young Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pope and Young Podcast. This is Jason Roundsville, joined as always by my co-host Dylan Ray. And we have special guest and Oregon girl, Christy Titus, with us today. Christy, welcome. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Absolutely. So excited to have you. And uh, we're just talking right before the show that we've had a a chance to meet uh, somewhere along the line, I think at one of the shows they've had recently. And and uh, I always appreciate, I find myself talking about Oregon just because, you know, grew up here and it's, it's, it's always been, I don't know, I've always had a fondness for it. I've tried to be a good ambassador, but it's getting a little bit harder these days with some of the goings on. Yeah, we're an interesting state right now on the political spectrum that's uh, defining all constitutional laws as we see most of them. So <laughs> it's uh, yeah. uh, not a trend I really I'm that proud of for our state. But uh, other than that, uh, if you put a politics aside, the state is a great place to live. Yeah. Yeah. If you could just, is there any way we could just get rid of Portland? If, and Eugene. If, <laughs> and Eugene. Yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah. If, if, yeah. if Oregon didn't have those two, we would be uh, once again at the top of the list for places yeah. to be in the country. And I was born in Portland. Eugene. So I say that with. Okay. You know, personal I, experience there. I, I was born just south of there in Cottage Grove, so I understand. And yeah. people are like, "Why? Why didn't you go to the U of O?" And I was like, "Man, I'm from that area. I wasn't going to go to school there." Mm -hmm. So anyway, and I have a few other choice words, but I can't say them on here. Roger that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thanks for being with us today. We're we're excited to have you, and uh, it's crazy. We're we're just visiting and and. Uh, so tell us so far, tell us about your season so far. Where have you been and what have you been up to? Oh, man. Uh, so I, I've had a fantastic archery season. I started out the year hunting turkeys here in Oregon uh, with my bow. I took the redemption and uh, got a really beautiful Rio um, outside of uh, Fossil, Oregon, which has a up and coming turkey population, which, you know, Southwest Oregon's really notorious for it flourishing turkey population but eastern oregon not so much but it's definitely has a big turn and that's been awesome and then uh yeah, when you I, when you think of fossil you think of sagebrush and kind of rolling hills and cattle yeah. country turkeys are not the first thing that pops to mind yeah well and the cool thing about turkey hunting there is they've got both miriams and rios and so um unfortunately i shot a rio but next year, I'm holding out for a Miriams because those things are stinking beautiful birds, and they're so big, and uh, their white tail feathers are just, they just make you a little awestruck. So I'm going to, next year, I might pass on a spreader to get one of them things. Okay. All right. That's... But, yeah. <laughs> so you're, so you're going to risk tag soup just to, just to get a different turkey. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're turkeys. It's fine. Yeah, oh, yeah, um, you know, it's not. Yeah, the, it's not, the tags. Yeah, the tag soup thing is close to home right now for me because I just went. I I saw the bull I wanted. I waited for him. I got him on camera, of course, when when I wasn't in my stand, and uh, and went without this year. So it's. Uh, it happens. It it does, and and from from most of what our guests tell us you have to be willing to do that to get the big ones. Well, I did that in Idaho this year. I spent 17 days with travel going to Idaho to hunt public land over there. My husband did not shoot a bear because he just did not see one that he deemed worthy of harvesting. Uh, you know, we had lots of legal bears, but to get a bear that's worth notching a tag on he just didn't see that and and i got fortunate i had a really nice chocolate boar finally come in the last couple of days we were there and i got a beautiful bear uh, we got a great episode out of that but you know he walked away from from 
you know, bears that most people would watch the episode and be like, why didn't you shoot that bear? Because you can't judge them right. hardly. You know, they're so difficult to tell what's big and what's small. When you're looking at it as the viewer, you don't realize you're looking at, you know, a 125 pound animal. They look big to you. You know, this thing's two years old and just weaned. <laughs> Yeah. We're gonna let these walk, uh, but that's that's tough for the viewer to see in that perspective of video. Yes, but and it's the same, probably the same guys who would be sitting there watching a whitetail video, saying, "Oh yeah, give him another year." Yeah. And then with the bear, it's just I've I've heard they're one of the hardest to judge. Extremely difficult. You know, the I got very fortunate with my bear hunt. Um, we had pictures of the bear, and the bait barrel is a really great size indicator. Um, and the bear I took was a chocolate bear. So, um, as soon as I saw the chocolate bear moving through the woods, I was like, Oh, this is that bear. And, and it was pretty easy to put two and two together. But there are other times where you have a black bear that's walking in and you're like, do I pick up my bow or not? Because yeah. you got to give them a minute to size them up. You got to look at them and really take that time on them. Yeah. Yeah, I had an antelope like that was coming in. I was like, yep, not a shooter. Didn't pick my bow up. And then he came into the tank. And then I'm like, mm, I always wanted to shoot one at the tank. Maybe he's bigger. Maybe he's bigger than I think. And he wasn't just, you know, <laughs> but I couldn't help myself. I had to do it. Your first impression was spot on, but you, yeah. you, oh, yourself, yeah. you walked yourself right into that one. Yeah, I nailed it. I nailed, I feel judged that thing perfectly. Too small to shoot, but uh, it's, I had to ground check him. So, yeah. Uh, now, so bear hunting, what else did you do this fall? Did you, did I went to Africa. Deer? My husband and I went to South Africa. Um, my husband is, is Swedish and German, and bow hunting in Sweden is not uh, allowed. It's not legal. So he had never bow hunted. So this year I got him a redemption and um, taught him how to bow hunt, basically. And so we went to South Africa, and he, he got an Impala, a beautiful Impala, and I and I did a spot and stock stable with my bow. Um, wow! So we had a really fun trip to South Africa. Uh, it was pretty special for sure. Yeah, sable is probably the next one on my list if I get back when I get back to Africa. That's yeah. you know the first time I went, I, it was just you know I, I had the whole array of everything, and so it just didn't make the list. But now you look at them, and they're just amazing animals. They're beautiful. So, so how's he doing on the bow hunting? Is he is he picking it up? He's obsessed. He's he's now shooting like three times a day. His bow. That's... He's out there right now shooting. Um, but you know he'll do this Cameron Haynes kind of style thing in the morning where you know we'll work out and he'll like do some weights and then shoot the bow and then do some weights and shoot the bow. But he's out there constantly and. You know, he's so perplexed because, you know, some days he shoots just so perfect. And then other days his groups are just a little more open and he's like, what is going on? And like, oh, welcome to archery. Yeah. <laughs> like, And, he, you know, I think it's frustrating, too, because it's easier for me to be consistent, even though I have some bad habits. Um, I have really struggled with target panic a bit. Um, and, and when I'm mindful of that, I shoot extremely well. Um, and so I think it's tough for him because I've been shooting a bow for so long and he's seeing me shoot. And then, you know, sometimes he shoots as good as me or better, but you know, sometimes he's not. And he's like, how come I'm just not quite always there? And, and it, it's just a learning curve. And then he's also learning, you know, he'll have six arrows and they're the same arrows, but they aren't all flying the same. And I'm like, Oh, number your arrows. And, you know, we're kind of walking through all of these yeah. things and, um, it's, it's definitely interesting for me because I've been doing it for so long. A lot of it's like second nature or, or he'll be like, well, why do you do that? I'm like, well, I don't know. I've just always done it this way. And then I have to really kind of go back and think about, well, why do I do things the way I do them? And yeah. how do I articulate this to a new bow hunter? You know, very much. Now, what got you into archery at the beginning? So I actually introduced my dad also to bow hunting. Um, my dad was always a rifle hunter. Um, and in my early twenties, I dated a man for a brief time. And, um, my dad was always into like elk calling. And I remember watching him do elk calling on videos as a kid. And I, when I was 13, he called in a bull and I got to be part of that. But 
when I was in my early twenties, I started dating a man and, and he was really into bow hunting and calling elk and it, it, you know, the guy was a dud, but the, <laughs> the hunting was good. Uh, so it really changed my life. And, uh, I told my dad, like, we got to start bow hunting and doing yeah. this. And it changed literally the course of my life. Yeah. Did you ever tell the guy, you know what? You're a total dud, but you really made my life better. Yeah, well, I think he likes to take credit for my success in life. Well, I, I got you doing that. And it's like, mm, yeah. you got nothing, buddy. <laughs> yeah. But you know how that goes. Yeah, that's that's good. So and and so got started a while ago, and it just just took off for you. Well, you know, it was like I think about it now. It was like twenty years ago. <laughs> It's like, I'd like to think it was just, you know, like five years ago, but right. no, it was like 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, and so but my dad uh, is obsessed too. Like my dad won't even hardly rifle hunt. Well, oh, no, I want to do that with a bow. And it's like, okay. It, it, like he went bow hunting 20 years ago and he really has not hardly picked up a rifle. Like it's, uh, I'm hard pressed to get my dad to pick up again. Yeah. You know, it, it's just a different mentality. It's, and it's, it's one for me because I'll, I'll hunt anything, anywhere, anytime. And, and I, I enjoy rifle hunting as well, but it, just in the last couple of years, as I've done a little bit more and more bow hunting, I, I, and I've been doing it for 30 years. It just was never my only thing. It was one of the things I did throughout the year. And I started bow hunting because, you, you know, Hey, it's a 30 day season in Western Oregon, versus nine days for a rifle so i'm I, right. I like to hunt i want to get out there and uh so it was just for me it's it's kind of a you have to mentally make that adjustment bless you because after after growing Sorry. up with a rifle where you're literally out there just just to notch a tag and then to go with a bow which is you know more difficult and then looking yeah, for that one percent club in oregon <laughs> yeah yeah and so it, it's really something that you find yourself having to do and and after my wyoming antelope hunt now i come back and and all of a sudden i'm not looking down on anything because last year i shot my antelope with a rifle i just didn't have time to to do it with a bow and and this year I went to Wyoming. I'm like, man, I could have shot like 500 antelope with a rifle and it would, none of them would have been a big deal. And then I, I did get one with my bow, but it, it was just a different experience. So mm -hmm. I definitely have that respect and, and I'm learning to appreciate that more. I'm curious to know as you've, have you, as you've helped your husband get involved into archery, what's been the biggest obstacle to overcome there? Oh boy. I don't really feel like we've had any obstacles. Um, the, you know, my local bow shop, I, I go down to top pin here in central Oregon and Justin down there is just an incredible human. And um, he's incredibly talented and very willing to share information and coach and help. And I, I don't really feel like there's been a challenge. Uh, I mean, he's shooting, my husband's shooting the redemption, which is an incredible bow. Um, and I, you know, it's, I, and, and who's that made by? Bear Archery. Bear Archery. Okay. Corporate yeah. partner. That's right. There. And so, you know, I don't think it's been any challenge. I think the hardest thing for me is, is, you know, when we go to Europe, we can't bring our bows. <laughs> you know, you got to leave them at home and it's like, it would be so fun to be able to share that over there. And, and you just can't. You know, that's actually why Pope and Young was brought about is because it used to be like that here in the States. And that's initially what we were found. Our record book was founded to go around and prove that archery was a, a realistic means of taking big game here in, in North America. So it's, uh, it's, I had no idea about that until I started here. So, well, hopefully we'll get Europe up on board here one of these days with, with the bow process. They have some target shooting there um, in Sweden, um, but, you know, I, I talked to some competitive archers that will go to Sweden and shoot, you know, but you have to have like an invitation letter and have a reason to be going there with your bow and huh. a lot of logistics that go with it. So, you know, for example, when we went to South Africa, um, 
we were going to have to send our bows home with my producer because we were going from South Africa to Sweden. So it logistically uh, going into Europe is a little more challenging, or, you know, if we're coming to or from an archery hunt. So we have to, even with a firearm, same, same situation. It's just yeah. a logistical struggle. Yeah. So now I heard you were just in Missouri chasing deer. Tell us about that one. Uh, so I have the, the best outfitter. I hunt with Prairie Land Outfitters, David Westmoreland, and, and he only takes a few people a year hunting. And I've hunted the same farm for four years. And David's great. I get to go out there and set stands and, and help with cameras. And he does just a tremendous amount of work with food plots and um, habitat management. But, you know, take every time I get in the stand out there, I feel invested in, in the property. Uh, because I've helped set those stands or help figure out where we want to hunt different food sources. Um, you know, whether it be like right now, the deer were really in the beans or the acorns dropped while I was there. So, you know, what, what food are we hunting? And, and then, you know, correlating that to what stands we have hung. And uh, so, you know, every time I draw back on a deer in Missouri, I feel like it's, you know, I've, I've got a big part of that success. And that's, that's, that's a good feeling. Very, you're not just showing up and pulling a trigger. You're part of the process. I try to be as much as I can. You know, I go out there two to three times a year um, and and try to, you know, really be part of that and move things around because the deer move all the time. You know, um, one year you'll have a travel corridor and then another year it'll change and, you know, maybe different types of trees are dropping acorns. I think there's white ones and what's the other variety? Uh, forgive my ignorance, but. Um, uh, you know, depending on what trees are dropping and then, you know, just the basic dynamic of, you know, when landowners put new areas where they maybe take trees out or, or change, you know, and introduce cattle grazing and things like that, you know, it changes how the deer behave. And so as a hunter, it's fun to be able to go there and kind of mitigate my response to that strategy change and in, in what the deer are doing every time. Yeah, Absolutely. You get to know the place and and what it's all about. That's exciting. Well, and the deer I ended up taking, we have on camera. And, um, you know, one thing that, you know, we had acorns drop. So those, a lot of those bigger bucks were kind of holding tight in the timber and just kind of sucking the forest floor. I've, I've got to, this one buck in particular came right under my tree and he was just hoovering up the acorns. And, um, and so that was really tough, you know, to hunt those field edges because they weren't necessarily going out in those beans or, and then coming back in, they were maybe staying in the forest and feeding all night long because they were going after those acorns. So, um, you know, the deer I ended up taking was in a spot where I, where he was bedding or where he was traveling through feeding and, and living. I could get in with the wind I had and I could get in and get set up without disturbing them. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's part of it is, you know, every week as that food changes, how do you get in and out of those stands? How do you sit those stands? How do you hunt those stands and, and those logistics with whatever wind you have for that day or that sit? Yeah. And those acorns, that's, that's powerful. I never realized how much, you know, I was on a pig hunt in Texas and the guy's just like, man, your, your timing probably couldn't get any worse because yeah. we just started dropping acorns. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's that mean? He means they don't need the corn anymore. No, no, so, they don't. Well, yeah. and that's the thing, like that first week of October, historically, on these particular farms is where they drop. And so I came the week prior to that thinking I was going to miss the acorn drop. So okay, we're going to have them patterned coming off the beans. We're going to have them patterned coming out of corn. We're going to, you know, whatever food plot or food source that they're, that they're on, you know, when, before they hit the timber and bed, I want to be in their way. Um, but once the, the acorns dropped earlier than we thought they were going to, and then right. I was like, oh boy, now we have to reevaluate everything. Yeah. Start over. Yeah, well, yeah. and last year is the same thing. We, you know, predominantly when I hunt this farm, we have a north wind, north-based wind, Last year we got in there, everything was south, 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 south. So I have all of these stands that we hung in March for a north wind, and we had a south wind the entire week I was there. So we had to reset everything in the middle of the night. And in some cases, you know, we'll move, 
30 yard increments, 50 yard increments, trying to get in that right spot where those deer are moving through in the middle of the dark <laughs> and, yeah. and just trying to be proactive and, and not taking a stand and saying, look, this is where I'm sitting. I'm, you know, we're willing to go in and move them where we need them to be. Nice. Well, and then you have success like you had and looks like it worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's also luck. <laughs> well, I yeah. got lucky and the deer walked by, <laughs> but there was a little more to it than that. But yeah. Yeah. That's uh, sometimes you make your own luck. That's uh, yeah. Dylan and I are, are always talking about, you know, you, you, it never happens when you're sitting on the couch, you have to be out there in, in a stand or on the hill or on the mountain and, and sometimes you make your own luck. Dude, we had some rain this week. Oh my gosh. Like deafening rain and thunder. Like we didn't have rain gear on because it was 70 degrees, but I'm not kidding you. It poured. And I, I was in my mind, I'm sitting in the stand thinking about this and like whitetail hunting or any hunting in general, it's all about endurance. And I'm not talking about how fast you can run or how far you can run. It's about what you're willing to endure for a moment. And here I am and my husband's there running camera for me and we're enduring this. Just my fingers had like lines in them from the being so wet. Like I was in the bathtub too long, you know, right. like, like, what are you willing to endure? Because I know once this rain stops, if I have the last 30 minutes of daylight with no rain, there is a chance the buck of a lifetime can walk in front of me. Yeah. What am I willing to endure to make this happen? And we sat through it all. That's good. And was that the day you got your buck? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. I endured it. Boy. <laughs> I endured it for nothing. I did it for nothing, <laughs> but it could have ended very differently. Actually, no, we went back in the next morning and, and, uh, <laughs> no, we got him the next morning, but, uh, you know, you just don't know you. And, and I've had it to where I've sat through the most, like two years ago, I hunted, it was six degrees. I sat daylight to dark. Six degrees was the high. Uh. I was so cold, but the big bucks were on their feet. And I thought if I endure this, there is a chance the buck of my lifetime will be at my toes. And he, he wasn't. <laughs> Don't get me yeah. wrong. He did not come. <laughs> but they're moving. And, you know, I'm seeing them cross fields at 80 yards or 100 yards. And I'm like, man, my time could come. And what are you willing to endure? I think that's the best component of being a bow hunter is bow hunters endure. The ones yeah. that are successful. Yeah, well, and it is, it's that commitment. I, you know, we just talked to Jim Willems, who just shot a tremendous typical uh, year before last. And it was, what was it, 24 days just for one deer. And it's like, wow, that's, that's, that's endurance and commitment the whole nine yards. And the guys that kill the big deer, like, like David, my outfitter, he kills 150 to, to 180 deer every year in kansas and missouri every year but he'll find one or two deer and he will hunt only those deer yeah. <laughs> and he'll spend the entirety of the season hunting those two deer or yeah. whatever that number is and that's it and he'll go all he'll not tag a deer if it means he doesn't get an opportunity on those ones and i'm just not that person i have five yeah. days i have six days whatever it is I'm going to go, I'm going to hunt and I'm going to thank God for whatever he puts in front of me. Yeah. Uh, but there are people that, that have that philosophy. I'm just not that person. Yeah. Although some people, I would take a little luck. Yeah. It never hurts to be lucky. Yeah. Some people have that target buck and that's, that's the deer they're hunting. It's, is it my target? But, oh, I've, I think this is a good win for my target buck. I'm going to, I'm going to get in the stand today and gone. They are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, come hell or high water, they're getting in the stand. Yeah. yeah. It's so Thanksgiving. We don't need to eat turkey yeah. <laughs> or deer hunting, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah, we'll eat whitetail as soon as we get back with the with the tenderloins. That's right. Yeah, so did you make it out in Oregon this year, this fall? I did not bow hunt Oregon this year. Um, not at all. Um, it just didn't, just wasn't in the cards for me. I, I had some stuff leading into bow season that uh, the well-armed woman chapter leadership conference, which I'm 
an instructor um, at that, and I host that event, and that's that's fifteen thousand members. So I, I was at that event, and then uh, I rolled straight from there into uh, Colorado archery elk, which I have been saving all of my awesome elk footage uh, for the bear archery new bow launch. So I'll be rolling out nice. some of those encounters, and you know, passed on some bulls and. You know, I, I was telling Dylan earlier, I had a bull at 10 feet and I was at full draw for four minutes. And never oh, wow. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, I just thought even if my body wants to collapse, if I could just hold this together at 10 feet, he's going to die. It never happened. Yeah. And it's, see, that's the part that you, uh, once again, not, not, not nagging on rat rifle hunters but that's those are the parts that you miss with the rifle because that hunt would have been over 20 minutes before it even began yeah. as an archer and here you are 10 feet can't get a shot four minute four minutes a draw that's a pretty that's a pretty hefty the bull could see me well he was behind a tree yeah, and so there's a branch separating me from the bull. And so I was at full draw for so long, I finally just kind of slowly dropped my left arm and rested my cam on my knee so I could get a break on my left arm a little bit. Um, but when he finally stepped out and walked across and gave me no shot, I just, I collapsed. Like, whoa, uh. <laughs> I could just out done. But what it did teach me, and this is something that my husband and I are both going to practice, is I'm going to do a lot more practice with draw and hold this year, um, preparing for next year. Draw. I want to be able to draw and hold my bow for two minutes and shoot accurately. That's yeah. my goal. That's, that's one of the big things that, that when you talk to experienced archers, they're like, hey, you know, one of the hardest parts of, of bow hunting is figuring out when to draw. Yeah. And so I've tried to think about that. I was in a tree stand earlier. And I, I had three cow elk come in below my tree stand and I'm sitting there and, and I purposely left a couple of limbs. I'm like, okay, I, I, I'm pseudo draw when they go behind this limb and I'll be darned if she, she didn't stop there for like you say minutes. Mm. And I'm like, you know, if that would have been a bull, that's where I would have drawn when I yeah. could have gotten drawn. And I, you know, I'm not sure how long they were there, but it was a long time. They're very apt at stopping and staying put for a long time yeah. um, and looking. And so I, I really feel like for me, it will be because if I can draw and, and wait out those moments, that's success. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you can wait them out for four minutes, that's more than most. Well, four minutes, I had no choice. Like if I would have drawn down, that bull was so close. I was going to blow the whole deal. And I thought, well, if I can just wait for him to step out to 30 yards where he was behind a different cedar, then I right. could draw down and he wouldn't see me. And I would still potentially have the opportunity for him to step out the other side of the cedar and redraw and, and pick up the shot. Um, so it's calculating, you know, trying to guess their move or where you can safely move and what you can get away with. Yeah. That's and I mean, it happens so fast on elk. It's unbelievable. You, you think, oh, they're just going to plot it. No, no, no. It's instant. And you have a split second to make that decision. So yeah, we have exciting. some, we have some awesome video we're going to launch. I'm okay. Like, like, you know, bulls at 45 yards and I've got a front shoulder and a head, <laughs> like full draw for a minute and a half. Okay. Yeah step out. No, nope, not going to get that step. It was just like that a lot this season, or I had a bull at 45 yards and I had come to full draw. He stepped out and looked. And then when he walked out, he was quartering away. Everything's perfect. The caller didn't know the bull was there and he hit the cow call right on top of that bull. And as soon as I wrap my finger around a release, bull's gone. <laughs> like wow. it was just that all season for me with elk, but the videos content that we have, the encounters, Man, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was awesome. And I got to share it with my dad, so it was pretty special. Oh, very good. Yeah. And so when, when can we see that? When when will that be out? Well, I'll start launching some of my elk stuff here directly. Um, yeah, start start rolling it out in October. Okay. And where can people go to see that, Christy? My social media is just at Christy Titus, so K-R-I-S-T-Y-T-I-T-U-S. And um, 
I'll have, you know, I'll have some shooter pass videos and some heartbreak videos or like <laughs> didn't get a step, that kind of thing. So a lot of it's, a lot of it's been fun. Yeah. So I'm working on the shooter pass because it used to be my old self was like shooter pass, shoot, shooter pass, shoot, shooter pass, shoot. I mean, that was the answer. And uh, my new self is thinking about it a little more, hope, hoping for the bigger one. So, and uh, what do you have coming up? I mean, whitetail is just getting going back east. So do you have some whitetail trips coming up? Yeah, I go back to Kansas the first week of November, and I'll be hunting the peak of the rut with my bow. Um, and uh, hopefully get to do some decoying. I love decoying whitetail deer, so I'm looking forward to doing that. And then um, uh, that'll be my last archery hunt of the year. That one. Okay. So t- tell me about this is something I don't, Dylan, have we talked about decoying whitetails? We have not. I know we've talked about it a little bit for pronghorns. Christy, tell me about I'm, I'm a huge duck and goose hunter. So tell me about decoying whitetails. Maybe this is my new thing. Dude, it is so awesome. So decoys. This is this is information I've learned from my outfitter. Mind you, I'm not a whitetail expert. I just want to preface that. So anything I say <laughs> is based off of two things, what I've been told and personal experience. So um, decoying with the, with the decoy, 3D decoy in the timber is a no-go. Uh, don't set them up. Um, it's too tight. The deer apparently don't like that. So all of my decoying is done on a field edge. Um, and the cool thing about it is like, I have some of these farm fields I hunt, they'll be 300 yards across the farm field. I'll have my decoy set up 15 to 20 yards from my tree stand. The decoy deer is facing my tree stand and, you know, I can do a series of grunts and rattles from my stand. Um, uh, a lot of times if I see a buck that's cruising across that farm field, I can hit a grunt or hit my rattle horns. When that buck sees that decoy, white-tailed deer are like little UFC fighters. They're like, Ooh, I'm not oh. backing down. You have the tiniest, tiniest little bucks come in for a fight and they poof up and they get stiff and then they just kind of swagger in. And, and what they typically do, or the ones that I've hunted have done, is they circle around the decoy and they want to face the decoy. So when your decoy is facing you, you know, 15 or 20 yards and that white tail circles it, it gives you number one, a super close shot. And number two, an opportunity for that deer to go broadside. And number three, they're totally distracted by the decoy. And I mean, even if you have just a little deer come in, the encounter, the experience, it's super amazing and fun. Wow. That sounds pretty cool. Now, have you tried a decoy on anything else like elk? Yes and no. So with elk, it can either really help you or really hurt you. There's a lot of states like New Mexico have done a lot of elk calling where the caller will use a decoy where it's really open country. If you have a bull like far on a hillside and he can look down. Um, I always try to call into a spot where a bull can't look down into because if they look down into a spot and they don't see something that tells them what they should, what they're hearing, uh, a lot of times they, they get uncomfortable or nervous or they'll hang up. So a decoy in open country in that situation can be extremely effective. So your caller sets up behind a decoy and uh, does some call series. Bull can look down in, see the decoy, find that effective. I've also had it to where I've had elk come in. They see the decoy and they're like, WTF, this is too close and this is not normal. And it's awkward. I shot my first archery bull behind a decoy. Um, elk were feeding i was kind of caught i had a tree to my left but i was kind of in the open i popped up a montana decoy it was just the butt so it just looked like a butt you know feeding and um, i set that decoy up and uh, the bull i shot was in a herd and they were just all feeding not really thinking anything about my butt sticking out if you will pun intended that was funny <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> anyway, uh, and I was able to shoot the bull uh, from behind my big butt. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So you have you have done some of that. I've put up yeah. a decoy sometimes, just you know, kind of on ambush hunts mm-hmm. for elk. And I swear, I don't know that there's ever been a time where I've put the decoy up and then I've even seen an elk to judge how it works. Mm-hmm. 
it seems like if I put the decoy up, then, oh, that's the day you just, they just don't come through. The thing with some of the decoys is like my dad's always wanting to tie a string on them and hang them from a tree. Well, then they blow in the wind and it's unnatural and it's freaking weird. So I think with the decoy and the success of a decoy is the situation you're using it in and, and how effective the way you use it is for that situation. I've, I've talked to some guys that will actually wear a decoy on their body. Um, kind of like for antelope hunting, you know, when you stand behind the cow decoy. Um, I personally haven't done that with elk, so I have no experience in that. But I think it can go both ways. I think it can freak them out, and I think it can sell the sell the story also. Yeah. Yeah, it's always always nice to hear about how other people are doing it. And there's so many different ways to hunt, and and it's it's always neat to learn new ones, at least for me. And the nice thing is a lot of them are new. I've been doing it for a long time, and I'm still learning all kinds of new stuff every week. So do I. <laughs> yeah. And so what what trips do you have coming up? Anything big? Are you going back to Africa, overseas? What's next? Next year, I'll go back to South Africa and bring in my dad. He wants to shoot a Cape Buffalo with his bow, so we're going to work on that. Um, uh, but for the remainder of this year, I go next to Wyoming to the Wyoming Women's Antelope Camp. I'll be mentoring a scholarship winner there. Um, very nice. Then I drew Utah for the Book Cliffs Tag at the Hunt Expo, and so I'm going to go try to um, try to get a buck with uh, with my rifle over in Utah. So good, lots good of for you. lots of good stuff coming up still. So now, how has you mentioned a couple times? So how have things been with you being a woman in what has I don't know that it is, but what is sometimes thought of as a as a male, you know, influenced or or I won't say dominated, but um, h- how has that been for you? The hunting community has been awesome to me. Um, the shooting community, not so much. Um, so the hunting community has been open arms, has been wonderful to me. Archery and rifle hunting has been wonderful to me. Some of the people in the precision shooting community, because I also shoot long range rifle competitions. There are some people in that club that are horrifically mean. Um, and I just, I have no words for those humans, um, but there are uh, definitely still some people out there that have a really tough time with a woman having any sort of, um, I mean, I'm an NRA rifle instructor. <laughs> I, um, I, I'm not the best long range rifle shooter in the world, but I step up and I try to mentor people and help. And I'm, I try to learn and get training and, and be the best I can. And there are some people that are downright vicious. And they just don't like, it's intimidating for them probably. Well, I mean, the, the MO that I'm getting is how dare she get up and try to teach someone something when she's not as good as me attitude. Gotcha. Um, where, you know, I feel like every person in hunting and shooting at every level has something to share with somebody that's more inexperienced. And that's how we grow the sport. Um, you didn't learn to play baseball from Babe Ruth, <laughs> you learned right. from your dad. Um, you know what I mean. So uh, I think I think there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of bullying that goes on in some of that. That's that's very uncalled for. Yeah. Okay. But hunting's been good. You haven't the seen hunting it. community has been fantastic. I, I um, yeah. I mean, I, I think women have been embraced in the hunting community long before the shooting community. And I think the pistol community has embraced women more so than, than the long range rifle community still is huh. missing the boat on that a little bit. Unfortunately. Yeah. I know uh, we had some ladies uh, at, at our convention here in, in July for the first time. And uh, we had a chance to talk to some of them and, and it's, I always like to get that perspective because, you know, especially Pope and young, we, there's this, this whole, you know, when you think of Pope and Young, oh, it's a bunch of, you know, old white haired guys. And, and, and when you look around that room and you're like, you know, for the most part, there's a lot of that here, 
but it's not because it's exclusionary in any way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, that's just what it happens to be a lot of times. Yeah. So it was kind of neat. Uh, we, in fact, we had Shelly on the air here with us and she was just talking about, she says, I, I was welcome. I was open. And, and yeah. that's exactly what we want to be. I mean, well, and hunters, if we want to grow the sport. We have to make it to where everybody feels like it's a sport they want to participate in. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as only learning from the best, I mean, you know, Michael Jordan was great at basketball, but I don't know if he would make much of a coach. So, yeah. yeah. So long range shooting, archery, uh, other pursuits that you're doing right now? Oh, boy. I don't know. <laughs> I just launched a podcast. I do the TV series, you know, my digital TV series. Um, you know, I'm hunting, doing the competitive shooting in the springs um, in yeah, I don't know. I mean, boy, I do so much stuff with, I work with SCI on conservation side, which I have for over 20 years. Nice. Um, and, uh, I work with the NRA on second amendment advocacy. And, and so I, I try to be involved in, in, you know, I think what's really important, um, and I see this a lot in hunting and shooting is people say, well, how do I get involved? How do I help inspire? There's no groups in my area you have to be the person to create that. You have to yeah. be the leader that says, okay, my area really could use an archery club or uh, a shooting club or some type of mentoring for new kids or, or, or reaching out to kids that don't come from the same type of family that is involved in hunting and shooting sports and welcoming those in. And um, our industry, the hunting industry, the shooting sports industry is going to take strong leaders that are willing to be that person to continue our sport. Yeah. And those options are out there. I mean, a lot, you know, with conservation groups and, mm-hmm. and groups like NRA and there's, there's a lot grant of money available. There's a lot yeah. of money available. You know, you, you take SCI has 150 chapters in the United States and you can petition your local chapter for grant money. You can petition the NRA for grant money. You can petition all of these nonprofits, Rock Metanog Foundation, you guys have grant money. Everybody has grant money uh, that people can apply and say, look, I have these great programs. I want to be a steward to my community. I want to help increase the participation in shooting sports and hunting. There's money and funding available and resources, curriculum available um, to help you do that. You know, Safari Club has the American Wilderness Leadership School. And um, so I think it's really something that we have to key in on, you know, um, Hopefully more parents are homeschooling their kids and, and they can start offering uh, more of this type of curriculum as part of some of that um, charter school, homeschool curriculum as well. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, especially where we are here, you just never know from day to day what's going to go on with, you know, mandates from the governor and it, it's it's a scary time. So it, it would be nice if if, like you say, people are able to come out of it on to the better, which is what we're all hoping for. Yeah. Oh, and Tiffany Likowski, you know, she just posted a really cool thing the other day. There was a, a woman in, in her photo and she's homeschooling five or six kids. So they kind of are com- creating their own educating communities or their own educational resources through homeschool. And it's a great way to introduce shooting sports into those smaller groups of of families and people as well. Um, and, and it, it gets the kids playing together and doing things together in the team sports kind of feeling. Yeah. It's, um, and it, it, it's interesting how that doesn't always seem to fit with school. I know when I was in school, I had on my class ring, I had hunting on one side and baseball on the other. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know of anybody else that had hunting on their class ring just because it wasn't a school type activity, but I'm like, yeah, that's my thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to roll with it and it seemed to have stuck. So it's doing okay. So uh, Christy, one of the things that we, we ask every guest on this show is when you're out in the field, up on the mountain, out in the woods, wherever you happen to be hunting, what is one item maybe something you know not a non-traditional type item so not necessarily a knife or a or a bow what is something that you take with you in your pack that you just wouldn't want to live without well there's two things 
lots of clothes are the first <laughs> thing. I'd rather pack it and not wear it than want it and not have it. So I, I always am like a mule. I have tons of clothes. And the second thing is food. Okay. Is there I'm any particular eat. food? Dylan, you taking bets on this? Um, no. Okay. Because <laughs> I don't know where it'll go. Okay. <laughs> no. I mean, that would my answer to that would be it would it would depend on what I'm if I'm backpacking or if I'm just out for a day, but definitely uh, food. And I don't feel that any meal exists without meat. So I pack a lot of meat in my backpack, which is also odd. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good answer. We will add that to the list. Yeah. <laughs> so have, have you ever tried um, traditional archery? Have you ever messed around with recurves or long bows at all? Mm -mm, I have okay. not. Yeah, Dylan's been doing that, and he just got his first buck with his trad gear. And, yeah, uh, yeah, we got that, to talk about that. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah. That's not that's a, a challenge I'm ready for. No, I'm not into that either. That's a little more struggle stick that I'm wanting to. Yeah, that's, there's a, I think when you start talking about archery, and earlier you mentioned, you know, some days you're just on, and some days you're a little bit off, and you're, your brain starts trying to process why am I not shooting as good? And that's more of the science angle of things. And I think, I think archery is a balance of art and science. Mm -hmm. And I think trad gear, the, the traditional recurves, I, I think that's a little bit more art than science, at least for me. So. I think that's awesome. He got his first deer with that. And it's a huge accomplishment that I think anybody can respect uh, because it's just no easy feat. You have yeah. guys like Aaron Snyder and South Cox that make it look easy, but we all know the truth. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got to share an antelope camp with some guys that were all shooting traditional stuff and they had everything from the latest and greatest from, you know, Baron Hoyt to, uh, one of the guys had, uh, self bows that he had made. And we, we went out to the range and, and I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm okay with just shooting my compound. <laughs> I probably need that. I, I don't mind handicapping myself, so to speak, with a bow, but I didn't need to go that far. But, uh, well, Christy, um, we sure appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thank you so much for jumping on the Pope and Young podcast. And uh, you've got a lot of fans in our community. And we wish you continued success moving forward. And uh, don't forget to put, uh, what is it? April 14 to 16, 23 in Reno, Dylan. Yep. That's All it. Right. Yeah. Put our convention on your calendar. We'd love Absolutely. to see you there. Yeah, no, we, I appreciate you guys having me on and everything that you do for archery and shooting sports and conservation and all the support that you guys give and, and making archery accessible to everyone. Like it's, it's very important that we have what we have with this community and um, that bow hunters truly unite like this. Absolutely. I couldn't, couldn't absolutely. So thanks everybody for watching and listening. Uh, we're happy to have you and uh, be safe out there. <laughs>